What is up, people, and welcome back to episode number two of Behind the Bike on the Hook It podcast. Before we get started on this episode, I want to first mention that these episodes are by no means meant to be sales pitches. They are not meant to favor one bike or brand over anything else on the market. The objective of this series is to take you, the listener, behind the bike and introduce you to some of the people who help bring these bikes to market, whether that's sales staff, marketing folk, designers, engineers, pro riders, whoever. It's about telling the story about how these bikes come to market and give you guys a bit more information on who it is that's behind the scenes making this thing happen. It's also worth mentioning that if you are looking to buy a new bike or a second-hand bike to do your own research, whether you're going to spend £10,000, £1,000, anything in between, it's really difficult to buy a bad bike, but do your own research. There's a lot of things you guys can use whether it's social media vlogs blogs magazine reviews youtube videos speaking to people who own the same bike make sure that you buy the right bike for you your riding style and most importantly for your budget speaking of budget today's behind the bike podcast features the caliber boss nut i think steve jones formerly of dirt said it best when he said this is a hugely important mountain bike And I really wanted to get Mike Sanderson on the podcast. He's the guy who started Calibre. And although the Calibre brand falls underneath the Go Outdoors banner and is sold in over 70 stores across the UK, the Calibre team is really, really small. And they are based right here in Sheffield, which I think is awesome. The Calibre Boss Nut came to market in 2015 and really upset the Apple cart. It's an entry-level bike meant to get people involved in the sport and keep people involved in the sport. So this is a cool conversation with Mike. We chat about how Calibre first came to fruition, team riders, product development, and we discuss the new 2020 Calibre Boss Nut 2. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to uh, myself and Mike. Let's get into this, enjoy. All right, no if I no do that, then I can find that on there. All right, fuck it, dude, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Everyone, if you're listening, hopefully you are listening because we're doing a podcast. Um, <laughs> welcome to the second episode of Behind the Bike. The first one included the Marion Mount Vision. This one, I have been testing slash riding the Calibre Boss Nut. And I am joined today by Mike Sanderson. How are you doing, guys? Uh, and your job is? Uh, so I'm the, my title is Senior Product Developer. But I suppose I'm sort of the Calibre Brand Manager, Product Developer, that kind of side of things, yeah. And we were just saying below, uh, underneath in the cafe, that you do pretty much everything. Like I do, yeah, I do an awful lot. Social media and everything. Yeah, so yeah, sort of answer the questions on Facebook, uh, a lot of the events. Um, I suppose we're a really small team, so mm. like on the event side of things, um, you know, I, I kind of know it all, so it's kind of in, it's me that has to be there, I suppose. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so... Yeah, an awful lot of m- more than you normally find, but that's what you get with a, with a small team, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, is, yeah. Although everyone has a, a, a job title or a, a day job, there's a, a huge amount uh, be around that that you mm, do mm. that's outside of your normal day job, and that, sure. that goes for the other guys in, in the team as well. So. Yeah, I know that feeling all too well. Yeah. <laughs> in a distribution company, it's, uh, yeah, you're definitely doing things which aren't in no- your normal pay grade. Yes, yeah. Jack of all trades sort of thing. Yeah, my customer services, uh, you know, I've not been physically trained in that. So, uh, yeah, I apologise if someone's ne- not had the greatest of customer services from me. But uh, I do try my best. So. I'm looking forward to talking about that, actually, because it, it'll probably come to a surprise to most people listening that it is a small team behind this. You know, yeah. you look at where it's retailed in Go Outdoors and stuff, it you, gives off the impression it's a lot bigger team than what it actually is. But actually really small yeah so like from the outset you know when we we started this and i started this i knew that we had to 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 be competitive Mm. um it's not just down to the product and and stuff there's a huge amount of other things that go with it and brand perception is is one of them and um you know i I, when i pitched this this idea to the, the the powers that be at that time that go um about this you know didn't even have a name it was just an idea um um the, the sort of the other part of that was like you know you've got to let me be in charge right. of of how this is kind of going to look if you see what I mean yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and and feel 
and and they, they were gracious enough to, to do that and then since then it has grown and, and we've you know, I suppose we've done some, as a small team, we're, we beg for forgiveness, as I <laughs> ask for permission, but nine times out of ten, we normally uh, kind of uh, have the ability to kind of go, yeah, we didn't ask, but it has worked. So yeah. you kind of get a small slap on the wrist and face <laughs> a, a full turning off. Um, okay. But yeah, in terms of like the imagery and everything like that, we just, I just knew that it had to look, like you say, like, um, you know, like a much bigger entity, um, you know, so our videos and... And all it all came together like you know sort of the, obviously we're quite price led and, and valued yeah. you know to bring that to the, the end consumer but it was always sort of like it was part of that, that idea behind the brand was where whether you're spending you know obviously we've got bikes up about three grand now but at that time we didn't but whether you're spending like four or five hundred pounds on a bike you j from other brands potentially at that time you never felt as loved okay there yeah. was never yeah. like a video about just a your unit like yeah it was it was never a video about your bike where there was always a video about the five thousand pound bike yeah you know you've yeah. got yeah. you know we're surrounded by some amazing imagery here <laughs> you know you've got these guys shredding the bike and doing all the stuff that you watch that video and, and and that's what you want to be doing whether you can or, or not is that that's what you aspire to do as mm. mountain bikers mm. um but you never had that on like that so i was like well there's no reason why, you know, so all of our bikes, we, we do a video and the same photo sh uh, sh or shoot yeah. um, treatment on all the bikes. The same love basically goes into it. So when it's at the end, sort of the last things, which is the photos and the videos and stuff mm -hmm. like that, it's the same thing. So all of our bikes will have a, a video that cool. shows what it can do. And, and hopefully then when you've got customers from buying it and stuff, they can kind of watch the video and go, oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah. All right. I want to unpack all that a little bit. Yeah. Because it's really interesting. So let's start at the beginning. This is called Behind the Bike, and it's all about the people who make this bike happen. So how did you first get started in the bike industry? Uh, way back when. Uh, <laughs> how old are you? I'm 37. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so okay. I started when I was, started mountain biking when I was 12 uh, in, uh, in Wiltshire. So, when okay. I was, so my dad was in the RAF, so we moved around a lot. But we settled sort of uh, just outside of Bath. Uh, we were talking about yeah, that downstairs, yeah. and um, there's quite a good riding scene sort of around sort of Bath Bristol way. Um, so mountain biking, um, just loved it basically. I played a lot of a lot of rugby as well, but mm. the, they were the two things I did basically was was rugby and mountain biking. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I rode to school on my bike. I did a paper round on my bike, and uh, you know if I wasn't training for rugby, I was on my bike. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I suppose the bike side of things really came into play as a kind of aspiration for a job when I was about 16. Okay. So I tried to join the army. Right. Uh, but I'm asthmatic. But I was really fit. Like I was like a uh, super fit playing like say a lot rugby, of rugby. Riding, riding bikes. So I was super fit. So I just basically ignored that fact. Okay. And went through all the sort of trials and stuff. But they obviously checked my medical records and went, uh -uh. No, really? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, he, he sort of joined the army and stuff. And, uh, you know, sort of credit to him. But... Uh, yeah, I was gutted basically because that was my aspiration mm. um, and uh, so I was like well what else am I good at so I was going to join the Royal Engineers and so I've got like a love for engineering mm -hmm. and and dismantling things finding out how they work rebuilding them looking at something in a logical manner and just going oh, I could do that better or you know something similar yeah. so I went to college and um, did an engineering qualification and uh, everything just revolved around if they gave me any kind of free reign you know, like, right, we want you to do a project on, and they kind of give you, it was all linked to a bike in okay, some cool. way. <laughs> okay. uh, and the same for university as well. Um, it was all just kind of like, if they ever gave us a, a kind of a, 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 a free reign in any way, shape or form. You brought it back. It around. brought it back to bikes in some way, <laughs> shape or form. And culminating in my, in my final year, uh, sort of, uh, wasn't a dissertation, but your final year project, uh, I designed like a suspension linkage oh, right. um, and stuff like that, and uh, and um, yeah, it was um, you know just everything was all about bikes because it was the one thing I really knew about, yeah. you know, uh, and I spent like I say so much time on my bike um, that I broke things or I didn't like something, and I was like looking at it in mm -hmm. a. Uh, in a sort of an engineering, an engineering way, way, just kind of yeah. looking at it going, oh, that could be done. Like, why have they done it that way? Or, oh, that's a clever idea and, and things like that, if okay. you see what I mean. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so, university finished. Um, what did you do at, at uni then? Uh, Computer-aided product design and innovation. Oh, check it out, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, in the worst place there's a mountain bike deal. I was at University of Portsmouth. <laughs> really? It's flat and concrete. Flat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, we did an awful lot of traveling around to try and find somewhere to ride a bike. <laughs> it was like if you were a trials rider or a BMX, or, which I was not. So um, yeah, yeah uh, my trial skills are weak. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I'd done a bit in the bike industry, I suppose, before. Um, I'd done a bit, um, I used to work for Alex Moulton uh, Bicycles. Okay. So they are handmade, really expensive uh, steel, mostly. They did some titanium stuff as well, uh, brazed in Bradford and Avon. Oh, okay. And they're like, they basically look like folding bikes, but they don't actually fold, they break in half. Um, yeah, yeah, it's weird. There's like a weird knuckle that they then you just dismantle them. I can't and you say I've ever seen one of them. Yeah, they, they've got wow. their famous one called is a pylon, okay. and it looks like an electricity pylon, really small tubing, really lovely, but they are crazy, like not crazy money, but people pay it, but they are yeah. lovely, you know, handmade yeah, British bikes. I've never even yeah. heard of it. So I, I got a, um, you know, like a work in an industry mm. thing through college. Um, obviously must have impressed and then got a uh, and used to work Wednesday afternoons because Wednesday you'd finish at college at midday mm. uh, for sports and stuff like that but our college team didn't have a rugby club so I just went and worked okay. and then I worked Saturday mornings as well with the guys and I actually used to build their wheels right so they used to get extruded aluminium lengths in and uh, I'd roll them okay. cut them pin them drill them then eyelet them then lace them up onto some hubs. No way. Yeah, so it was like, you know, when people say I build wheels, I physically used to build wheels. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> it was a long bit of cheap little pipe beforehand. And um, so it was a quite a, an in-depth sort of thing. So, yeah. uh, But I learned a lot because, you know, it's quite a, it was in converted um, stables. So I was kind of in the middle ish of the, the, the sort of the stable. Mm. You know, the guys to my right were brazing uh, the frames up. And then you had the assembly to my left, which was one guy basically. Right. You had another guy doing painting uh, in another uh, out building. Then you had uh, another guy that was building. They had um, elastomer suspension or like rubber suspension. Yeah. And they did that in house. So they they melted, you know, sort of cured all the Jeez. rubber and, and wow. molded it all. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was kind of like a, a quite a good place to kind of learn how a bike was built because they. Yeah. Did it all there, yeah. um, so that was quite cool. So, um, but that finished when I went to uni. So I only did it for about a year, uh, maybe a bit less. So, right. Um, and then, um, yeah. So after uni, got a, a job as a project manager for a pharmaceutical company, which was all right. Okay. Learned a bit about business and yeah. and uh, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, then on a, a job come up at Rally for a. Were you still riding at the same time? Yeah, I was still riding. Um, yeah, like I was still, you know, I was right. I'd actually, when I finished uni, got really back into racing downhill. Mm. I've never been a, 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 an amazing racer or, or rider, uh, but I just enjoy it. I really, we were saying before we were thinking like, you know, that sort of split second before you go into the gate, <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> that nervous, you know, energy where you're just like going like, what, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> like, uh, and, but then when you get to the bottom, you're like, oh, I really enjoyed yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. know. So, uh, you know, can I do it again, kind of thing. So, um, but uh, yeah, but you know, I shattered my pelvis, um, you know, in that time and stuff like that. So it kind of sent me back a little bit. Mm. And uh, but yeah, no, I was still hugely into riding. And then I got uh, the job as a junior product manager, right at Rally. Uh, at Rally. Um, and I joined when I was 23, 24. Okay. So I was by far one of the youngest in the team. Yeah. Um, and um, I think quite fairly, sort of quickly, they realised that, you know, sort of, uh, I, and I realised I knew an awful lot about sort of what's going on at that time, okay. but didn't necessarily know a huge amount about how a bike was built, right. which was quite a, a steep learning curve because, you know, it was just like, oh, well, why can't they do that? And, oh, okay. You, you mean know, like, just like, like stacking like, a bike? And yeah, and, like, like and turning things round, you know, kind of, oh, just change that, it's easy. And you're going, well, it wasn't until on my first trip out to uh, Cambodia and Vietnam where Rally had a factory yeah. uh, out there, really uh, high-end factory now. Um, I think Specialized make an awful lot of their bikes there now. Okay. Um, and it was a real, it was really good. It was a real wake-up call of, mm. like, the amount, of timings that have to come in there's so many bits on a bike 
yeah. that you know that all need to be there at the right time and then you've got a production slot and if something's delayed you miss your production slot but then you can't just push in front of someone else because they've planned it if you see yeah, it's yeah. so much involved yeah, and it yeah, could yeah. just be down to daft things you know like spokes really yeah right. like some people assume it's always the big things but you ain't got any spokes, you ain't got any wheels, and <laughs> you haven't got, you a, got bike. a bike. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's it was a huge um, eye opener okay. to just see, you know, all the the frames in the ceiling and the wheels all pre built and everything then just coming down to the assembly line to then be manufactured and right, then yeah. put into the box and then you know packed into a container and then four or five weeks later it arrived in the UK. You know, it was it was uh, an insane kind of. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I. I Were really, you doing that for rally bikes? Or, yeah, or so I was. So I could say I was junior, sort of like just helping along, learning for probably six, eight months, and then uh, they gave me um, some projects which were really successful. So I launched some like sort of um, twenty-four inch sort of street style BMX, basically, okay. right. um, under the rally brand, like as a sort of teenager bike that went really well. And then from there, they just kind of uh, gave me more and more projects. Mm. Um, so eventually, I ended up being the European brand manager for Diamondback. Oh, wow. Um, so prior to that, I was looking after Diamondback BMX, and I uh, we were buying the American range. So it was a really odd thing, but you got like Rally South Africa, Rally America, Rally UK, Rally Germany, which was a licensed brand, but Derby Cycle. It was a really... It's yeah. a really odd thing to try and get your head around. Yeah. But we were buying the American range and they're based in Seattle. And the, uh, the BMX kind of scene there was very different to what it was emerging, where like in the UK, it was the bikes were becoming lighter, lower, um, you know, and it was kind of, you know, a lot more sort of spin tricks, you know, and, and, and foot right. tricks, where in the Seattle kind of area, it was all still hucking down stairs. Sort of yeah, just like right. they were built like tanks, you know, where then in the sort of the UK European side of things it was everything was coming a bit lighter a bit you know okay. higher rise bars wider bars you know and, and we just weren't on the market so I was, I was like Look, give me a chance yeah. can I can I have a go at it and they were they were kind enough to let me go awesome. and um and it was a real success right, right and I think that's what then led me to so you were spending time in Seattle as well learning the market no no, no just I no. uh, used to meet the guys uh, in the far east so yeah. Tai Taipei um, show and your bike show which is coming up uh, in a week's time mm -hmm. um, so yeah I used to meet those guys uh, quite regularly and they were you know we, they were nice guys and they were doing a great job as well yeah. uh, but it was just a different markets you know sort of um, you learning could, to adapt to it yeah and, and um, yeah and then so ultimately we ended up uh, doing our own quite a lot of stuff for the European side of things and again that was a big steep learning curve for me definitely made mistakes for certain and, yeah, sure. and learned <laughs> from those and uh yeah, so, um, and then I had this idea, basically, uh, for Calibre, was what I was trying to do for Diamondback. Right. Um, so how long did you stay at, sorry, how long did you stay at Rally? I was at Rally for about seven years. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, so, um, and uh, I built, you know, sort of, and I was starting to kind of create the same sort of ethos about trying to bring people in and, and, and keep <coughs> them in the sport. Yeah. Um, but at the time, Rally were looking to sell um, to the, sell the brand, if you see what I mean. Okay. So their their ideas uh, of what they wanted to do were different to mm -hmm. mine, if you see what I mean. They were needing to make the books look better in terms of you yeah, know, sell yeah. more volume, sell more units. And I'd spent a lot of time, you know, building the brand up uh, as I have done with Calibre. You know, I've done a lot of events. Uh, I was doing demo days almost like every other weekend through the summer. At the time, I, I, I was I had a, my my wife was my girlfriend, didn't have kids. So it was a bit easier. Yeah. Um, but still, like, but still, job. yeah. And then, like, you know, just to kind of then to kind of, um, yeah, just I don't know what that was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, to uh, kind of have that hard work kind of undermined a little bit. I, mm. I wasn't willing to kind of carry on. Okay. So I'd, I'd been designing some bikes for Go Outdoors under the Diamondback brand that they were buying as a um, as a, an SMU special makeup bike. Right. And and I'd seen those guys were growing, um, but I'd heard through various contacts that they needed some help uh, in terms of their buying side of things. So I approached uh, Go Outdoors and, and John Graham, who was the owner at the time. We had a, a, a meeting, which I didn't realise at the time was an interview. 
Um, <laughs> he was just asked to come in for a chat and then ended up being sat in front of a panel. Um, and it was just a bit awkward. In really? all yeah, it was a bit kind of like, you know, you just came in just thinking, like I dressed smart because I kind of thought it might do, but I really didn't. But then it ended up being like a full panel interview. Wow. Um, but obviously uh, I kind of um, made a, an impact. So I came in and, and uh, Shord goes uh, buying of, of all bikes and accessories and clothing up for about, it took me about a year. Okay. So they'd had, uh, they'd had various people in to do it over about 18 months. And at the time, uh, sorry, they didn't have their own brand. No, so just buying. Just buying or, yeah, they were uh, buying from who they, the, who they could. And, run. and it was a real, like I walked into like a real mix match of, of things because you had, I think they'd had like a, a professional buyer in. Okay. Um, and uh, you could definitely see they'd done stuff like by Pareto analysis, which is like basically like by the numbers. Okay. But then, so we didn't have like any 24 inch inner tubes in. Right. Because they obviously didn't sell very many, but you were so willing, you can't have a bike shop without no. the full Got spread of, bike, of inner tubes. <laughs> but then we had carbon handlebars in, and that was because the person before them was really into their bikes, but wasn't a buyer. Okay. So they'd bought like stuff for them. If what you they like. yeah, yeah, it was yeah. just like so. I walked into this like real weird like product mix of some real nice Gucci parts, and then just none of the <laughs> stuff that makes you a bike shop. <laughs> so it took me about it took me about a year or so to to kind of just get it all sorted out. And in the the, the background of that at home, I'd been working on uh, uh, this brand basically, right. and it didn't have a name. It was just a uh, um, an idea, an ethos, um, and then um, you know the the name came about after just spitballing um, with uh, a few people in the marketing team. So Ed right. Brazier, an yeah, actual yeah, fact yeah. of, yeah. of uh, Airdrop. Um, so he was working at Go Outdoors at the time. That's right. So him and I were, worked quite well together. And, and in all honesty, I can't remember who came up with the name. It, it could have been it could have been Ed to be fair. Right. And the idea was was a high caliber product was where the, the, the name came from. Okay. Um, and, um, and that was, you know, sort of behind that, that ethos of mm. trying to bring people back into the sport or bringing people into sport and giving them a really good first outcome. So it kind of, the, it came about, it's when my first son was born. Mm. I'd gone to Canic Chase okay. uh, with my wife and my son and my dog. And, uh, and uh, my wife had given me a couple of hours. I went out and rode my bike. And I'd not done a lot of trail center stuff before because there was no need to. I could go out for a day and, yeah. and there was no sort of need for me to be at home or with, you know, with the family because I didn't have a family. Okay. So as I got a family, it changed. So I was like, so we went out and it was enabling me to go and ride my bike for a couple of hours, meet Katie and, uh, and Rowan uh, and uh, at the, the cafe, have some lunch, and then we went out as a family for a walk. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, I'm sure loads of blokes do it, and, and women as well. It's it's an easy thing to do if mm -hmm. you see. It. I mean, there's car park and all that kind of stuff. And I was sat there eating my sandwich, and I just watched some um, a group of like three or four lads come back to the cafe. And two of them obviously had the grin on their face as you should do. Mm. And two of them just looked miserable. And then I just was like, oh, what's up with these guys? And then I looked at their bikes. And they were like the steepest seat ang uh, head angles, the slackest um, seat angles, super short. Brakes that obviously didn't work, judging by the amount that they were covered in dirt, yeah. obviously where they've been sliding <laughs> around. Um, and they just looked, and I was like, and those guys are never going to do this again. Right. They, they did like hired bikes maybe, or they just bought their own. Or yeah, it, you know, they, they, I think <laughs> they, it was either either with their mates mm. from from work. They were like kind of like 21, 22. You know, so they weren't kids, if you see what I mean. They'd obviously driven there and stuff. So they may be work colleagues or, you know, mates from school as they grow up. And they got, you know, and the other two guys were definitely mountain bikers. Mm. You know, they had a nice kit. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. And then there was also the other two guys that obviously were just brought along, maybe on the first ever real taste of mountain biking. Mm. But you could see them going like, you know, if I went over to them and just went like, <laughs> are you going to come back next weekend? They'd be like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I've spent more time on the ground than I have on this thing. And, <laughs> yeah, and like, I just don't, I'm not enjoying myself. And I was yeah. like, well, th that's not good for the industry. That's not good, like, you know, for the sport I love. Um, and you would like, we've got to do something about it. Otherwise, if it keeps carrying on like that, then we're not going to have yeah. anyone riding bikes, if you yeah. say, I mean, and we're not going to have these amazing places to to ride, well, you know, whether you like or loathe trail centers, 
the UK is yeah. so small, we need them. We do, um, definitely. So without people turning up and paying for parking and paying for a coffee and a sandwich, they're not going to carry on and, and breaking the odd thing or forgetting your helmet, which I may or may have not done several times <laughs> and have to buy a new one from the bike shop that there. Where's <laughs> my helmet gone? Oh, crap, it's still at home. Get another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I was like, well, you know, that we've got to be able to do something. And that's kind of where it came from. Is okay. I was like, um, so yeah, the first bike launched in 2013, which was the 2 2. So it was like £350 hardtail. And you, first of all, do you pitch this to go outdoors as like, I've got this idea. Yeah, so I kind of said like... Take it back off their buying power. Yeah, so I kind of said, look, I've got this idea. And it was also, at the time, I was buying the whole range. So I was buying all the bikes from all the other brands. And Mm. I could fit my bikes in where I needed to because it was up to me, basically. And I was like, look, I've got, you know, and the work I'd done at Diamondback, I knew how important the £500 Price, price point was it's kind of more like 600 pounds now okay. but that used to be like uh, mbi still is a dirty dozen test mm. which was a 500 pound t- price point it was it was really important it was the one we used to go after okay you know everyone used to try and have that coveted 500 pound bike yeah. and i'd say now it's kind of with price points and stuff moving up and mm. currencies and stuff it's more like 600 pounds is, is that price point okay but then it was like so i was kind of looking at like how much money you could spend to get like a really nice bike that wasn't breaking the bank. Mm. And I had in my head like three, 350 pounds. So it was kind of like set myself a challenge effectively of like, could I build a really nice bike f- for that price? Mm. Um, and yeah, and it was, um, cause we were brand new, I knew we needed to focus on uh, branded parts. So yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, is it hard then to get in touch with the, you know, your rock shocks or your SRAM or whoever it is? No, not so much. It was, it was. It, oh, we've yeah. definitely got a lot better relationship with those guys now yeah. than we did at that start. But that that's because we we've, we've grown and and uh, you know we've we've had success, I suppose. Um, but yeah, like it was just like I, I envisaged someone walking into a guy outdoor store, seeing this bike, hopefully liking the look of it, and then kind of totaling up the parts, you know, the brands that they know, whether they're kind of into man bike, maybe they've bought a magazine, but they've been influenced by the marketing of these other brands. So yeah. RockShock, Shimano, WTB, um, you know, we had this kind of like shopping list thing like, like Chavs have on their car, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, um, sorry if you've got that on your car. Um, but it was just kind of like, so those people walked up, they kind of like see all these brands and then have an assumption of the price tag. And then when they see the price tag would be pleasantly surprised. Oh, yeah. So that was that kind of idea. So that was that first bike. And we won like best in test and five out of fives and, and stuff with that bike. And that really then I think kind of gave me a little bit more free reign. The, the powers that be. Were yeah, that was like, they were like, oh, he's, he, he can't, let's give him a bit go. And the 500 pound bike did quite well as well. Um, you know, we sold quite a lot of them, but obviously the 350 pound bike just ran away with it. Yeah, um, yeah. It was, you know, it was the number one selling bike for the, the department. And um, yeah, that bike had a couple of iterations and then like the new version now, the two cubed, okay. um, we couldn't have two, three because of the two, two, three, because uh, orange, orange. has that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, the two cubed is basically that same bike, but with, 650b wheels and, okay. and it's so. it's the kind of modern iteration you can't 50 quid but you know it's, really? it's yeah it's oh. just it's just everything's gone up a little bit okay. if you sit so it's 400 quid yeah 400 pounds yeah so um but you know it's it's a nice bike mm. and, and, and that bike in itself um uh is it won some decent awards with the, with the cycling press and stuff like that and yeah. you know we sell an awful lot of them as well so um, awesome. but the whole, like i said the whole idea of that bike then set the precedent for the whole caliber yeah which was just bringing people into as we've gone up the price points although people go oh yeah but it's more money like the centuries and stuff like that but the ethos is the same got you yeah um you know that it's about if you're going into that you know this bike here if you're wanting a full suspension trail bike you don't have to spend. No, it's fine if you want to. Mm. You've got the money, mm. brilliant. Um, but you don't have to spend. Where before you did, yeah. you know, you did have to spend. There's a definite barrier to entry, weren't there? Which yeah. was multiple thousand pounds. Yeah. Know, but not that long ago. So this kind of came around, um, it was supposed to be a logical progression, but it was also a quite a competitive bloke. 
if someone tells me I can't, then like I generally <laughs> kind of take it as a, a, like it. a personal kind of <laughs> slur and go, bet I can. Bet you can't get a million downloads for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll try. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was just like, there, there was this old adage of like, if you've got le- uh, less than a thousand pounds, sorry, like if you've got a thousand pounds to spend, buy a hotel. Mm. You know, it was always this thought, don't buy a full SAS. And what be, sort of year are we talking about here? Uh, like, sort of 20, well, this is when 2015, but sort of, you know, up around 2014 when yeah. I started uh, investigating whether we could do a full suspension bike that that was worthy of, mm. of your thousand pounds. So it's not a, an instant amount of, amount of cash. No, no, no. Um, and it was kind of like, you know, there was always this old adage, you know, especially magazines would always say, and they're kind of like, you know, if you've got a thousand pounds, don't buy a full SAS or less, you know, buy a hardtail, yeah. it'll come with better, and, and of course it will do. Mm. But I was like, like, just kind of like, well, can it be done? So we just started, I just started the idea and, and just kind of working with our factory at the time and mm. just kind of working with what could be done and then, you know, looking at the geometries and, and looking at who else was out there at that kind of price point and, yeah. and reading What was the, there back then? Um, so you had a Boardman, which was pretty decent okay. from yeah. Halfords. Um, and... Not a lot else, in all honesty. I think there was a few people, but they were compromised in sort of dramatic ways. Right. Uh, the Boardman itself was a pretty decent bike, to be fair. Mm. And I just kind of had that crown, but um, for if you want to spend it on a full size buy of the Boardman. Yeah. But then I was looking at that and read a lot of reviews and stuff, and it was it was still too, it was too short, uh, it was too steep, okay. um, and I was like, well, that's easy. You know, it's it's it doesn't cost anything to. To make it longer and slacker, right, yeah, um, yeah. so it was that was kind of a, a first kind of right. We'll do that then, and then um, it was just things on like shock tune. It, okay. it was like so when I did the because we didn't have the link up with SRAM that we do now, um, but I got three of the same shocks and went and rode Devil's Elbow, right? Um, which uh, for anyone that's not local to the peak <laughs> is is kind of it seems it's to like be one of our gnarlier trails. It's yeah, like a, yeah, but it's got like a, it's, it's got like a fast flowy bit to begin yeah. with. If you start from the car park, and and there's a lot of like compressions, and then you turn the elbow, and then it just turns into <laughs> just no, a, <laughs> yeah, there's a rocky gnarly rooty fest, and then there's an easy ride up. Yeah, um, so it kind of gives you like a really good um, a short loop to test so i did two runs on one got to the top unbolted it bought a new one in two runs on make some notes and did it that way um and just settled on this shock tune like i'm a bigger guy mm. i've not got a lot of finesse i'm definitely not a floaty rider <laughs> uh my motto is the fastest route for me to be is a straight one over <laughs> or through anything um so but i kind of like again kind of put myself into Potentially, like again, this might kind of pigeonhole, but the pe- the guys and girls that would be riding this bike, if you see me, that aren't necessarily going to be at that point in time the best rider. Yeah. You would have all the skills, um, and I settled on the shock tune, and and um, you know it seemed to be the the right one, if you see what I mean. Mm, so, mm. Um, and it's just things like that. Like I really kind of put myself into who was going to be riding, and at the time the, the the stem was quite short and the bars were quite wide, yeah. obviously things have progressed since yeah, then yeah. and people if they're looking back at the V1 going geez a 60 mil stem what's <laughs> they going on about but at the time that was quite a short stem right. um, and it was just really kind of looking at everything on the bike and, and uh, tyres making sure that we had like a, a really good grippy front tyre where mm. before everyone seemed to be just running the same tyre front and rear and it was just like well I don't do that on my bike is a higher end right now. Yeah, yeah. So you know, and it's kind of like, well, if you're getting into it, you need all the help you can get, you know. Definitely. Um and then it's like, you know, the brakes and just everything kind of had to have a reason to be there. Yeah. Um and uh yeah, obviously it went well. I was gonna say so that was the V one which came out two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen, end of two thousand fifteen, yeah. So we ordered uh, 150 of yeah, these. Yeah, you were saying when we first met. Right? Yeah, so the the business was super nervous. We, the, the mantra I kept getting told was we'd never sell a thousand pound bike. And uh, we we sold them all very quickly. And then we were air freighting them in um, as soon as we could get them because it would take about five weeks on the water. Right. And how hard is it also to get more made? Is that? Uh, made yeah, there was still a lead time you know, on that, but right. then obviously an extra five weeks or six weeks 
on the water and getting through customs and traveling into your di distribution center and stuff like that. Um, so we were air freighting them in and basically not making any money. I can't remember how many we air freighted in, but it was a lot more than, than <laughs> I thought, but the demand was there. So yeah. it made sense. And um, yeah, so we did that. Um, and cool. then the, the, the what did it feel like then when you started sending them out for test with your MBR dirt and stuff like that and the, and the response was what it was because it was yeah I mean, like won. yeah that, that bike won bike of the year with MBR <laughs> and um, I was driving to my brother-in-law's wedding and I had my wife in and my eldest son my youngest wasn't born then and then we were driving I can't remember who else was in the car and I got a phone call and it was like you've won and I was like one what and he's like yeah, you've won bike of the year and I was like you're kidding me and then like you overall bike of the year Jeez. and I was just like on a massive high and it was a bit of a bit of a weird one yeah but I knew I'd made and like I knew the bike was was, was good, good. Yeah. and I you know I, I would and I believed in it and um yeah but uh, to win that was pretty mental and then yeah just sort of the other kind of thing I'm always nervous yeah no doubt like it's it's uh it's a, a sickening kind of feeling. Like if you, I speak, if you ever get any of the the magazine guys on uh, and on this and stuff like that, they'll probably testify to. I'm always kind of sending them a text, kind of like, you know, what did you think? You know, like kind of just, yeah. You've even done it with me. Yeah, yeah, like just kind of like, yeah. I just, I think because I've put so much effort into it, and and and, and this is literally all and passion, I yeah, suppose, and yeah. soul or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I don't want someone to have a negative effect, you know, on their mm. sort of riding and stuff. Either. So, but uh, yeah, like the the reviews and like of it, and then it's just been an evolution um, up until this point yeah. of just kind of seeing how that bike was used. So that V one, I remember turning up to Tweed Love and uh, wasn't on a caliber, and um, I saw two guys racing Tweed Love on one of my bikes. And just getting ridiculed by my mates. Getting, really? Yeah, yeah. Because they were like, why are you not on one, Sanderson? <laughs> and they're going, because I didn't design that bike to be doing this. <laughs> and it was a real kind of shock to see that bike. That's rad. That's so at cool. such a, 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 you know, a mm. pretty gnarly event in terms of, you know, sort of, and, and they probably beat me, to be fair. I was not particularly racing very well that, that day. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, it was the, the V2 was kind of, Right, well, we'd seen how people had, had been using it, and it was like, right, let's we, you know, we need to change right. a few things to kind of accommodate. It's that. what it's getting used for is changing. So yeah, you have to adapt. Yeah, so you just need, adapted sure a little bit, getting... so the geometry changed ever so slightly, <laughs> and a few other bits and pieces, and um, yeah, it was just kind of an evolution. And then the Evo was an evolution again. So one by drivetrains were more readily available, okay. um, and and things like that. So. Yeah, it was all just kind of uh, an evolutionary mm. side of things. Um, but then, yeah, we just kind of, we'd been trying for ages, especially in the Evo, to get a few things on that we just couldn't do, but then we've managed to on this one, like yeah. the bolt through back end. Yeah, yeah. Because um, it's daft, like, you know, people probably won't realise this, and I'm sure a few keyboard warriors will probably chime in here as well. But they're going, oh, how hard can it be? It's, you know, it's just a and again, this is hub. one thing that we initially spoke about was this bolt through back end on the new one. So this, the bike that we've got here with us, if you're watching on video, this one. Um, this is a 2020. Yeah, so it's out now, but yeah. it's kind of like going to run through for 2020. Got you. Okay. Um, Do you stick to model years? Not really, yeah. no. It's because we, we don't have to. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think more and more, uh, especially the big boys aren't necessarily sticking to that either. Colour changes. Yeah, yeah just as and when things come out, yeah. because otherwise you kind of potentially miss, like, so the SX group set, we really, really wanted to launch this with the SX launch okay. that SRAM did, um, just to piggyback off their uh, huge amount of marketing. <laughs> we just couldn't, uh, we, we couldn't get uh, our, our sort of sales all sorted out in time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but it would have been nice. Um, but yeah, so, it's, you know, so the SX group set's only been out uh, about six eight weeks yeah so it's you know you, but if we'd waited for model year you know you would have been waiting another couple of months at for least sure. so you yeah. wouldn't you would have missed like three well, months there's always that race as well isn't there to get bikes out it's just getting earlier and earlier yeah and we used to have it with the bmx is one of the directed diamond back it was uh mongoose was our biggest competitor right and uh the, it was this it was more for the reps to sell it into to the stores okay so you'd end up with like this kind of like just need to be two weeks ahead of mongoose so you get 
your reps in the door with the new range of bikes before they did and then the next year they'd beat they'd you and it, just, <laughs> it just ended up just yeah being pretty crazy <laughs> um, but yeah, in so, the middle of the year you're doing 2020 stuff yeah those brands it's, it's, so, so there is definitely like an idea to kind of get the the majority range but as and when like kind of we see uh, an opportunity or we want we'll just drop mm. when it's ready if you see as opposed yeah. to trying to rush it and, and mess it up or or delaying it and missing some sales it's yeah. just like if it's yeah. ready yeah. and we're happy with it it get it, and we can we'll we'll bring it in so yeah. um okay. but yeah like so the the bolt fruit hub like you know we 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 done it on the triple b which was the boss nuts big brother um basically um uh, last year but we just couldn't afford it it's like stuff things like the hub so the hub actually you know people don't think but it actually costs more mm. than a qr hub for a couple of reasons one the hub itself costs more um, and then two with a QR hub when you buy them in sort of an OE they come with a QR right. when you buy a bolt through hub it doesn't come with a bolt through so you've got to go and buy the bolt through as well right. um, and then there's obviously the additional kind of mouldings and, and kind of things but because we'd used the back end already mm-hmm. that had been paid for oh, basically. This is the BB. yeah this is the triple B back triple end B, effectively right. um, so we'd, we'd kind of got a year of that and we knew it worked and it, we'd, we'd paid for the the, the, the molding charges already and um, so it enabled us for this year to bring it onto this and then it also meant as well for for us and for our factory it's much simpler the frames are all the same okay so the men's women's bosna and the triple b are all on the same frame so we can produce uh all the frames and until you've painted them they could be any one of three bikes if you see what yeah, i mean yeah, uh, and yeah. so yeah uh, they've got a paint on them and they, they could be yeah, any bike. Right. Got you. Um, got you. So it means that, you know, just economy of scale and us being able to react to, uh, you know, maybe one size sells better than we anticipated. Mm. We can rob Peter to pay Paul basically. We can go, well, we'll, we'll you know, rob some of the triple B numbers because they're not selling so well and put it into the boss or vice versa. Right. So, yeah, okay. it, it just made sense to yeah. try and get them all under uh, one chassis. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think... Steve Jones said it perfectly in a review that this is one of the most important bikes to ever happen in mountain biking. Because like we were talking about before, right, there was, and in some respects probably still is, like quite a big barrier to entry. If you want to just try mountain biking, I mean, you'll have probably had it when you take a bike out or you get home with it and your missus goes, oh, what's that worth? And you're like, seven grand. And it's like, what? That yeah. is a lot of money for a lot of people. Yeah. For you most know, people. Yeah, to totally. Like, you know, like, don't get me wrong. They're not all seven grand. An entry level mountain bike's three and a half, probably four. Entry, yes. Entry level, so the, high-end entry level. the Century kind of project, kind of that was a, a funny story. That that started. We were at a mini enduro in the Forest of Dean, and the timing went down for about forty-five minutes, nearly an hour maybe, and it was pissing down with rain, and everyone was cold and shivery, and I ain't got a jacket, so I was doing my best to kind of like covertly snuggle up to people for <laughs> trying to steal some of their body warmth. And uh, to keep my mind at kind of constant off of how cold I was, I was just totaling up the people's. And I'm in the masters category, so mm. there's a lot of more of expendable income it's in the masters. Yeah, you know, yeah. you've got guys that have got decent jobs and and <clears throat> uh, and, and good credit, Nate. You know, all that kind mm. of side of things. But I was like looking at like what the average price of uh, the enduro bikes that were scattered around me was, and it was about five thousand yeah. pounds. And then I kind of like put myself into this. It just got me thinking, like, if I, if I didn't work in the bike industry and was, you know, very grateful for trade accounts and such, would I be able to get a £5,000 mountain bike? Uh, you know, and I was, the answer would be yes, I could. Yeah. But it'd have to be on finance. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I've yeah. got, you know, a mortgage and I've got cars and, you know, all this kind of side of thing. So it would be quite a big thing. A so, yeah, and it would have to do everything yeah. you know that would be i'd have one bike i wouldn't like i'm obviously i'm a lucky guy in terms of uh, what i do for a job and, mm. and uh, other than yesterday i was out on the bike yesterday and i thought i just spotted the it was quite funny we were out with sim from mbr magazine yesterday yeah. for a feature and we were riding up black rocks and uh, a uh, ref pilot in a typh- uh, typhoon came past just heard it <laughs> and then wow. just banks over and just shows the underside of the plane and then you can hear another one, but it was even lower. 
And I was just sort of going, no, those guys have got the coolest job in the world. <laughs> like, they have got the coolest job in the world. You know what I mean? Like, everyone, like, men and women would swoon when you're in a dinner party or a bit of a bit and go, what do you do for a job? I'm a fighter pilot. <laughs> oh, <I see> <laughs> yeah. So that was quite, they were like, and they were going, I've got a cool job, but they have got a better job. <laughs> There's always someone better and more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, I, you know, I've got, like, a few bikes that I'm able to, you know, I've got a hard tail, I've got mm. a, a full sus, I've got enduro, I've got a gravel bike, you know. But the, if, I, if I was not doing that, I'd have one bike yeah. and it would have to do the vast majority of everything. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of like then it was like, you know, it kind of got me thinking. And, and it was a combination of that and my mates giving me a load of stick for turning up to these races on other people's bikes <laughs> and going, what, what is it you do for a job again, Sanderson? I was like, oh yeah, I should probably say. So, um, so it kind of, the, that started the project. And then yeah. once I'd kind of got enough uh, of an idea, so I'd ridden quite a lot of other people's bikes and I got an idea of geometry and, and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, that then pitched that idea and, and to the, the the powers of being, I mm. suppose, because the success of the boss and that, yeah, they were like, yeah, go on then, you know, you go know, for it. Which was, you know, a big deal because, you know, that bike there was nineteen or twenty pieces uh, that were, you know, totally new molds to us. Mm. So that's not a small amount of investment. Uh, and then obviously there's the price point of the bike, and and yeah. you know, there's a lot of nervousness for myself, um, even to like the way we branded that bike. You know, like caliber is really small uh, on the chain today okay. because I was like when I was riding the prototype um, it was a lot of people going what, what is that because it didn't have any branding on it it was just all black yeah. and they were like it looks nice what is it and you go oh it's a calibre and like people go nah no it's not it's really too. and then I, it got me like going oh, are we big enough yet for people to accept hmm. that you know like accept the brand is going to do that and I was up until the sort of the the, the launch of that bike, I was still super yeah, nervous that yeah, yeah. that we were maybe uh, not there yet in terms of brand perception, um, and uh, you know that's why one of the reasons we did the the video out in New Zealand and stuff like that. Um, you know, it was just kind of like we've got to do everything like the big boys do. Yeah, if you yeah. see, I mean, we've we've got to, like you say, your first point, we've got to really kind of showcase that. There's a huge amount of time and effort gone into this. Yes, we're only a small team, but mm. it's you know a lot of passion, a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of thought has gone into this. Mm. Um, and yeah, like it was then the, the other point was that it sat at that top of that enduro stage, going like, well, how much is acceptable? You know, how much could I get a bike for yeah. that I wouldn't necessarily need to put it all on? finance or you know or you know if it was on finance it wouldn't cripple me yeah um and i was like well two grand like double the boss nut yeah you know could, could it be done um and then the the sort of from there it was like well if it's gonna if it's gonna be it's gotta be out of the box race ready yeah it's gotta be nothing on there that you need to change right now, now people will change things yeah. for sure but it's gotta be but it, like box. in terms yeah. of like you can take it out of the box Turn those rims tubeless with a bit of tape and some valves. So mm. I appreciate that, you know, you can buy valves for what, 10 an hour and a bit of yeah. Gorilla tape for three quid Not from <laughs> BQ. Uh, you know, and I was like, but I'll, other than that, just because that would, our factories, you know, not would not mm. like me for telling them to, to, asking them to, to turn those wheels tubeless. But, um, but yeah, so two grand, turn those tires those and wheels tubeless. And go and race it. Go race, yeah. You know, there's nothing there that will hold you back in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the idea of it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And then the pro version was, we just came back because we were like, well, if we're going to prove to people that the, the bike's worthy of maybe those upgrades mm. uh, and that it can be raced, we were like, well, let's do a, a higher end version that has got all the bells and the whistles uh, and then get some, some guys and girls. Yeah, you got some. Cool yeah. team of people out there right yeah yeah that, that's, it's the, the team's another thing that's kind of just happened right and like i feel a bit of a passenger in that respect <laughs> um you know we've got some amazing guys and girls that that ride for 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 caliber and um i feel really kind of you know really pleased that i know them uh they've all got like a really unique 
uh, individualism yeah. to themselves. Yeah. And um, I'm hopeful that you know that I can help them all out in a, in a way other than giving them a push bike to ride <laughs> and, and some bits of kit. But uh, yeah, like you know, Chloe. Yeah. She's just back now. I see on Instagram. Oh, she's back, yeah, yeah, riding a horse and oh, and, right. and, and yeah, you say she's on like, I, you know, like. I just try and put myself into her shoes a little bit. Um, you know, 21 years old. She did a couple of the European rounds last year of the EWS. And then this year, she's traveling the world Crazy. with her push bike, racing some of the gnarliest stuff yeah. I've yeah. ever yeah. seen. <laughs> like, oh, my days. Like, I would not want to ride. Do that North Star. That track. North Star. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, when shit. you've got, like, I was watching, uh, I think it was Wind, like, run down that he does. And he's just, you could, he looks shell shocked. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he, the, all the riders he's kind of interviewing are either have got that kind of just smirk on their face of, I'm so glad I survived that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and his brother obviously is, he's got to be devastated for Eddie and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, like, yeah, so that's sort of, you know, you know, and she's with the, the rest of the girls there. And, fun. you know, they're there, you know, I love seeing what they're doing and, and, and they all seem to be having a real good laugh mm, mm. and enjoying themselves and, and, and ultimately doing really, really well. So, yeah. um, so that's, that's one. And then Simon Paget, yeah. our French, uh, slope style and dirt jump rider. I bet you never thought you'd be saying that no, like, caliber French slope style, right? Yeah, no, like, <laughs> Holy so, shit. but the, uh, I can't remember if I've told you this story as well. But, so that was London show a couple of years back. And he'd been on the stand a few times uh, at the Calibre stand. We were right near the, the sort of start ramp for the Heir to the Throne. Mm. Um, I think it was a gold um, stage event for the, the, the freestyle tour. And um, yeah, so he was looking at the, the, the astronaut dirt jump bike that we just launched at the show. And it had a huge amount of people looking at it. Um, yeah, like we had Sinead Reed, who's I used to race BMX, and right. she's like a, a bit of a hero of mine. And she's chatting to me about this bike, and I'm like in my head, just going, be cool, be cool, be cool, be cool. And then she's like, oh, you know, I'd love to have one to ride bowl hills on and stuff like that. And I'm going, this is mental. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we had like a huge amount of response to that bike, which I didn't anticipate. I knew it was a nice little dirt jump bike, but it was like the start of the show. Mm. So Simon had been on the stand a few times, but my French is pretty zero and his english is is decent a lot better than my french so he'd been chatting and then uh, we had a uh, the first prototype on the demo area mm. which was just basically a, uh, an oval on a flat bit there was nothing there to test any bike really but people kind of like to kind of swing a leg over bike for sizing so it's good yeah. for that and then one of the guys came running over he was like mike that that french lad just borrowed the astronaut I'm like really excited. I'm like, oh, all right, well, that's fine. He, no, 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 he's not on the test loop. I was like, where is he? And he looked up and he's at the top of the start ramp. And I just had this mild panic going, I really hope someone's tightened the handlebars, <laughs> you know, up properly. <laughs> and then before you know it, he was like, you know, upside down, 360 in it and, and oh, stuff yeah. like that. And um, so towards the end of the, the show, he came and spoke to me and we had a good chat. And uh, I gave him an email, kind of, kind of after the show, I was like, look, we haven't got a huge amount of budget. I said, like, you know, we've just blown it on mm. the London show. It's not cheap to, to A, be there, have a stand, hotels, travelling down. You know, it takes a huge amount of cash. Yeah, sure. um, but I can sort you out a bike. And he was like, yeah, that'd be great. So I was like, no worries. A couple of days later, sent him a, a bike. And then he, he's pretty prolific on Instagram. Loads of cool photos. He had dirt jumps in his back garden. I think it was his nan's back garden. That's right. I think it was his yeah, nan's yeah. So like, um, uh, yeah, so he's putting all this stuff. And then about two, two weeks, three weeks after the show, he just drops me this like really just one line text going, right, I'm off to New Zealand to crank work. So I'll uh, post stuff. And I was like, like heart just like I went cold because I was like, <laughs> Like, I knew the bike was good and I knew it was handle it. But I remember watching the crankworks on my iPad and my headphones in. It was like 2.30 in the morning or something. My wife's asleep next to me. And I'm just watching him. And I, I knew it wouldn't. But yeah. I just still had this, sure, yeah. this in the back of my head going, just don't snap. Just don't snap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, and then he's there, uh, like, oppo tail whipping off of, like, massive boner logs. And, and I'm just watching this run, just kind of going, like, this is just so surreal Crazy. that four or five weeks ago, he just kind of wandered onto the stand mm. and just went, you know, 
I'd like the bike if you see me, and we just sent him a bike, and now he's the other side of the planet. I think he got sick at that event, yeah. and it was just like, this is really, really surreal. That is crazy. And then we got just so much content from, from him. Unfortunately, mm. he's been uh, really ill. Uh, yeah. So shortly before we launched the Century, uh, he was supposed to go out to New Zealand, and uh, yeah, he got really ill. And um, yeah, I think he's on the men now, touch okay. wood. Um, so uh, there you go, yeah, he's he's just back in the gym. Um, he's a bit of a gym bunny, and uh, yeah, so uh, but I'm not sure he's been riding his century a bit and stuff like that. So fingers crossed he'll be back to mm. kind of his old self uh, in the not too distant future. Awesome. Um, but yeah, that's just like, again like just another sort of surreal. And then we've got um, uh, Ali and Ben yeah. who are just through acquaintances through uh, G and Sam who do our video and. And photography, you know, again the Sheffield kind of base to it. Mm. Um, studying here, but they're great characters. Like Ali's just got the most infectious laugh going. Like he's just—I don't really know those guys too well, but I do yeah. and I don't. Yeah, he's I just—I know of them. He's just not. insanely talented. Makes everything look bloody easy, and then just he just yeah, he's got this infectious laugh that right. just makes he just makes me smile. And he's uh, he's 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 pretty hard on bikes as well, so he's. And he comes from an engineer and he's studying engineering. So he's yeah. good for me because one, he's very brutal on bikes. So he broke a couple of the prototypes, uh, sentries, but he was able to kind of converse. He can't with actually him. tell you why. Yeah, like, so, so we've had riders that I worked with in the past, like, I wouldn't mind saying it, like Sam Pilgrim, love him to bits, I think he's brilliant. But when we worked with Sam at the time, uh, when I was at Diamondback, it was just like, I want this, this like, this. And, and it was really hard for me not being anywhere near as skilled as him to. Yeah work out what he was asking if you see what I mean yeah. where with Ali he can just converse in, a, in an engineering way and it was mm. it's just much easier for me mm. um, and uh, and then Ben Crooks he's just he's the most polite guy going on you know I think he's he's, he's really good fun but okay. uh, again like he's he's just annoying like he's just, <laughs> just, just manuals anything <laughs> and we went on a video shoot for the new triple B which is going to be out very soon right. so you're going to like say same frame and um, we're at Greno, and I uh, can't remember who asked, it might be G. And I'm like, yeah, can you come out of that corner and just manual from there to there? And he's like, yeah, no worries. And I was like, I can, I'd struggle to manual that distance if it was flat. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let alone it being up, down, and through corners. And that's, that's like, <laughs> so one, it was amazing to watch, yeah. but two, it was just like spitting tacks because I'm just nowhere near <laughs> as good as he is. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's been, yeah, quite good. And then we've got little yeah. Kens as well that right. um, he's been probably uh, I think Kenzie's probably one of the most long standing he is 13 now okay and um, we we started sponsoring Kenzie when he was 11 wow um, and uh, yeah we built him this kind of little custom 24 inch boss nut frame and Sick. yeah he's like a third in nationals or second in national champs and it's basically that frame right uh, over spec in terms of fork and, and yeah. rear shock and, and parts but ultimately it's the frame and um, yeah no he's He's just uh, smashing his way through things. Cool. And, yeah, like there was a video out of him doing a course preview of the National Champs track at Revolution. Mm. And you can, I can't remember the gentleman's name now that's following him, but you can definitely see that he's having to try really hard to keep on the back of, you know, like <laughs> he starts off quite chatty and then towards like the middle section, Ken starts dropping him <laughs> and then all of a sudden goes very quiet where he's, <laughs> he's concentrating on putting in some effort into catching Ken's. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think kenzie has got a, a, a huge bright future ahead yeah, of him. Yeah. Um, and it'll be great to kind of watch what he, what he continues to do. Right. So yeah. that's cool, man. So like the race team side of it, <coughs> the ambassadors have grown. How about the team within Calibre? Like, how it, did it start off just with you then? Yeah, so Calibre was just me, just you, um, for a long time, and then I was doing, like, I say, the buying side of things as mm -hmm. well. Um, and then I suppose that you know, in terms of you, got, you know, got to give huge credit to the guys I work with. So when it started to get a bit of a monster, and I was just struggling to do the buying of branded yeah. parts and accessories, clothing and bikes, as well as develop the bikes. Uh, you know, I had a good discussion with my then boss and we brought in a team of people basically right. to, well, a, a buyer basically. Yeah. Um, so it's a guy called John Williams. Mm -hmm. That's sitting next to you. So he buys all of the branded side of things. So that uh, enables me now to just focus on... You on, fully focus on Calibre. Focus on Calibre. And then we've got a guy called Paul Air, 
Um, so Paul does an you know, amazing job. He's super clever uh, with the numbers. Uh, so he does all the ordering mm -hmm. um, with a team of people that uh, sort of sit below him. Uh, but they, he orders everything. So okay. he orders all of my my bikes. He also orders with all our branded suppliers and, and the bikes and stuff. So, you right. know, credit to him because he's working out how many bikes are going to get in the container, the mixes. You know, we have good discussions. Uh, they're quite good, actually. We call them line card reviews. So you basically sit down and, and look at what you've sold, work out in advance of if we order today, when's it going to arrive. Mm. Then you kind of, he's really clever at like roughly working out. But he's, He's always, he's always like sort of mystic Meg in terms really? <laughs> of working out what we're going to sell from point A to point B okay. and then working out do we need to order if you see what I mean so yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're always pretty good because you kind of sit and the, the some bikes are just tick along mm. and they don't because they're not doing like vast numbers like the boss night they, they just sit in quiet but it's not until you kind of like sit down and look at how many you sold over like maybe four or six weeks yeah. you know what well, is that, you know, okay. it's like our fat bike, the June. That was one of those bikes. That was just a, fat bikes were a kind of uh, a craze. Yeah. And I was like, I really wanted to do one. And the same sort of thing, I wanted to do sort of a bike that could, uh, like I wanted a fat bike, but I think about a thousand pounds was the cheapest you could buy at the time. Yeah. And I was like, there's no way I'd be able to drop a thousand pounds on something I might not enjoy. Mm -hmm. A bit of a fad so, bike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, so I was like, well, 600 quid. If you didn't like it, you could sell on eBay for 400 quid and you're not too much down. But mm. then if you did like it, the whole idea of that bike was upgradability. Okay. So it had to have full fat bike width hubs because a lot of the bikes at the time didn't. So there was like a couple of bikes out, I won't mention it. Oh, but they, they had sort of non-fat bike hubs, so it really limited your choice of wheels. Mm. Uh, the, the head tube had to be uh, tapered so you could fit like Rockshop blue toes were the only fork at the time. But there's more now, um, you know all those kind of side of yeah. things. It had to be so. If if you decided, yep, yeah, fat biking is for me, and you wanted to drop, and some there's like a weird. Some um, people did decide that. Mate, yeah, some people there there is. There there's some guys out there that that, that you know fat bike is for them, and that'd yeah. be credit to them. So, um, you know, I really enjoyed. I raced mine three years in a row at um, Mountain Mayhem when we sponsored it. Okay. So we got. I think we came second in the fat bike team thing. And, it was about two o'clock in the morning and one of the other guys that was racing in like a, a normal team mm. was like, you boys are in second. <laughs> and we're like, I think I just got another beer and like, it wasn't my turn to kind of go out. So I just got a beer. I was like, and the red mist descended then. I was like, well, I'm not giving up that. And that went down. I went and got, got like some high five or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like red mist descended. I was like, right, let's go. Um, but yeah, they're, they're fun bikes to ride, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then uh, it's a divert. Um, team wise, um, I've got a real big hand to me is my uh, mate Steve okay. that I've known since moving up to Rally, actually. Um, but it's weird calling him Steve. We just know him as Brown. Um, his surname's Brown. <laughs> um, so he's my right hand man in terms of warranty and tech. Okay. So I was doing all of that before as well. Um, so I was assisting the stores. Uh, with any technical information, not just on our our bikes, but any technical, Anything, I, wow. you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty decent mechanic, so yeah. um, I, I was able to help them either over email or phone on any technical questions and or queries. Uh, but then I was also answering, like I say, the the, the customer side of things mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it was just getting too much. So he's been brilliant. He's you know sort of able to come along and and uh, just help with that. that okay customer sort of thing and then also the the, the stores as well right. um and then just you know he helps me out in um uh coming to the far east so we're just kind of getting him uh, a couple of far east trips under his belt um and then i think we have one more under his belt and then i'm gonna send him out on his own really yeah so um he's you know but the, the far east trips like i remember my first one out on my own uh at rally and it was a pretty daunting thing yeah, when, no you, when you realize you've got you know you know, a couple of millions of quids worth of bikes that you're sample checking or production checking, then if you miss something, mm. that then when the bike arrives, yeah, they're pretty easy to fix when they're prior to, if you find something prior to it being made, they're quite an easy fix where as soon as you put that thing in a box, oh, it's a pain. Yeah. You know, you've got to open the box, you've got to have a, uh, take all the packaging off, you've got to locate the problem, you've got yeah. to take a part off, you've got to put a new part on, then you've got to package it up again, put it in a box, 
reseal the box. But it, you know I mean, like it's 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 a big deal. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it was pretty daunting. So um, yeah, and then sort of outside that, we've got this real core uh, of guys that, although technically aren't employed by Calibre, they are such a big part really? of it. Yeah. So so there's G Milner, uh, yeah. Sam Taylor, oh, mate, and yeah. uh, Johnny Taylor who weirdly has an office next door. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, uh, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Johnny um, and I work really closely together. Uh, so he does all the graphics. So he, he can take full credit of, of making these bikes look as... Uh, he's done a great job, especially on the new ones. Um, hey, that thing looks awesome. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, looks yeah. awesome. Like him and I... You're never going to get that out of a van and people go, that's horrible. Because it looks... The paint works insane as well especially yeah. if you get it out in the sun it's like a metallic yeah it's really right? deep isn't it yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks, looks insane like I say um, I'd love to take credit I am just not very good at this that's the one thing I'll hold my hands up okay. that and naming bikes like <laughs> um, yeah, I hate naming bikes and I hate coming up with paint schemes I know what I like when I see it Yeah. so Johnny and I you know uh, he'll be probably the first to admit it we, we kind of do argue for certain we're like a married couple uh, because you know they'll be like he'll have an idea and I won't like it necessarily but you know like we but then we work quite well together mm. and then eventually you'll figure it out yeah something comes to, okay. to it and, and it works really well um so yeah Johnny's brilliant in that respect um you know he's he does a really good job for us yeah. in there so um and he does an awful lot other than he does like the website design um and uh yeah, like, what else is stickers for freebie? You know, he's, yeah, yeah. he's a really good guy. Um, yeah, so, and he's he's also really, like, he's he, he comes to the shows because he's, like, really into the, the, the bikes as well. Mm. He's really good. He'll talk to anyone, which right. is a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. Anyone that knows Johnny knows he gets you into trouble quickly. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Sam with the photography, uh, but he also does our social media in terms of um, he'll, him and I work closely together and, create a plan you know mm. so we'll know what we've got coming up in terms of events reviews new light bike launches and we work together in a create a diary or a okay. calendar yeah and then he's much better at wording it and because he takes all our photography he's got the bank of photography so no he knows which photos to yeah. to put in and stuff like that and then g uh with the videography um and then the four of us come together and like i said right at the beginning we had this uh, we knew that Calibre, I knew when we started that Calibre had to have that that image that it was much higher than maybe what you yeah, would, yeah, yeah. would think it was, yeah. if you see what I mean. And I think, you know, and I hope anyway that we've definitely achieved that and that's very much down I think to, the, to the three of those guys really yeah. helping out because, the, you know, image of the bikes, the photography. Um, the whole so, package. Yeah, and then G with the, the video element. Um, and like I say, all of the bikes, we... we we might not go to maybe as far off distant lands for every mm. but the same, you know, G brings the same camera, you know, with, I don't know, but they, they look bloody expensive yeah. um, and <laughs> gimbals and, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, so that's all, you know, kind of the same amount of effort and, and, st and production, I suppose, mm. goes into whether it's a £400 hardtail or the £3,000 century yeah. is the same. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, like like we were just talked about with the team and stuff, people probably wouldn't realise that you guys are based in Sheffield, which is pretty cool. Like yeah. As far as the calibre side of it, so you're based here, like in the middle of middle of Sheffield, middle basically. Of Sheffield, yeah. <laughs> Not too, which is yeah. cool because again, people might have that, you know, especially looking at where it's sold and stuff in go outdoors. Oh, a big corporate company sat somewhere in London in an office. It's like no, you guys are keeping it pretty real. Yeah, yeah, just, in, just in, in yeah, Sheffield, like just out, out quite a bit, and yeah, yeah you know, sort of. Thursday nights mostly and, and through the summer and stuff. We're trying to organise a chainless race, uh, fun right. race at, um, at uh, Lady Canning's on, on Blue Steel for, for fun. Uh, so I'll give you a new vote for that. In, so, um, um, this bike will kill it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lady Canning's, oh my God. Um, yeah, so run what you brung. Okay. You know, if, so a few people are kind of going, oh, I'll bring the dirt jump bike, that'll definitely be quicker. And yeah. I think a fat bike might be the one personally. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like kind of... Um, you know, yeah, we. Do, I really like Sheffield. It's 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 a really like a thing. The thing yesterday uh, with the, with MBR and stuff mm. like um, Cy with Kotick, You know, he got in first because, the, like I say, that there was all about this the, this particular feature about the the trails that 
uh, a behind the bike, if you okay, see what yeah, I mean, like yeah. a similar thing, an idea. And um, so I had already done his, and he'd done Lady Canning's and The Devil's Elbow, right. which is one of our favourite places to go yeah, and test yeah. the bike. So I was like, oh, I can't do that one, thanks, Sam. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's a really good place, I think, for you know. Sure. And we've already mentioned Ed with Airdrop, yeah, and and so you know, much going on right yeah, there. and and the, the, just the you know, you, the riders that come out of Sheffield mm. is, and then also the, like you say the university as well. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I you know I, I like to say it's a good university, but I like to think a, a lot of the people that are coming here is because they like mountain biking. Definitely, and they like yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. we're going to come to this scene that. It's sort of similar to Bristol, uh, in, you know, in a sort of... I get it loads, obviously. I'm on the road all the time, seeing various bike shops all over. And uh, people love, you know, if you say, oh, you know, we're from Sheffield, you always get that, like, oh, I heard it's, it's pumping yeah, up pumping there. You're like, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yes. But you take it for granted. Yeah. And then, you know, you go somewhere else and you're just like, oh, it's not as good here. I just want to go home because I've got the Peak District on my doorstep and yeah. this, that and the other. So... And it's sort of like the, the, the riding is, like, really varied, isn't it? You sort of... Even on like say the the white peak to the dark peak yeah. and, and stuff like that, you've you, you've got something for for everybody and and is a real mix. And then yeah, you've got like bowl hills and, and uh, you know there's BMX tracks and pump tracks all over. There is, yeah. uh, and not you know Chesterfield BMX track and the scene that that those guys have got. Mm. Like that's one of my favourite places. It's on the way home for me. Okay. So it's kind of throw the the, the astronaut in the boot <laughs> and have a couple of runs around and and uh, yeah, there's, there's a just you know sort of in the a short driving distance or mm. you know you've got a real big scene and um it definitely has helped in in terms of the development of that but yeah like a lot of people didn't when we first launched uh, a lot of people didn't realize that yeah yeah, yeah. That that's where it is i think perfect segue to talk about the riding and stuff so i've been riding this one for like a month i think give yeah or take, about, about a month yeah i rode the one before which was your last it was the last prototype last yeah. prototype this you know the model we've got here with us today is the physical is, is production, is the one that you yeah. buy right so there's a, there's a few changes from the one that i first rode yeah head angle there's a, a few other little things yeah um you know we talked about it before perfect barrier to end uh, sorry perfect bike to get involved in mountain biking i went out riding on sunday with a few friends um one of which jordan who you'll know jordan yeah. Gold, right so he's on his nomad i think yeah we've upwards of six seven thousand quid his mate came tom trek slash i'm on the boss nut and this is like the perfect thing because you know you think about how much fun everyone had that day i had the same amount of fun as those guys on a bike which is a fifth of the price and cost as much as their forks exactly yeah so talk to me a little bit then about you know the spec the changes you made from the v1 you call it the v1 yeah the v1 yeah so uh, as to what we've got and what people <coughs> could potentially buy today if they're interested in buying one so frame wise i suppose uh, the, the we've got the bolt through that we talked through before yeah. um and then um geometry wise it, it, the bike's progressed in terms of its reach numbers it's quite a bit longer than uh the v1 v2 and, and evo um, so between sizes, it roughly goes between 13 and 20 mil longer okay. than its predecessors. So that was kind of off the back of the century, basically. It was just realizing that that extra reach, you know, really does give you a lot more, uh, control and, yeah. um, sense of comfort, I suppose, like that ability to just feel mm. in control. There must be an aspect as well with what you guys do with this following a market trend a little bit as well you've got to yeah you know keep up to date with that yeah definitely and um especially with this bike you know uh and, and my competitive nature is really what i suppose we could have, uh, have sat on our laurels and wrestled on the laurels a little bit but i really still want to carry on and keep that that crown you know yeah, so yeah. i'm all up for a bit of healthy competition and it's got to, ultimately it's good for the consumer yeah because like i say when we launched this there wasn't really an awful lot of uh brands out there having a go uh, but now you've got uh, quite a few more and some of the big boys are having a go. So mm. in terms of, for me, that's worrying. But in terms of consumer, uh, that's good because really, yeah. it means that they've got more choice now, which okay. they never had. Um, yeah, so we've lowered the BB a little bit. Okay. Um, again, just kind of bring that that rider's weight down. Um, cornering's a lot better than it was before. Uh, and just that ability just to chat your way through the rougher stuff. Mm. Um uh, head angle's gone up to 66 degrees okay. and then the seat angle's come uh, to 74 and a half, so up a degree. And um, that was weirdly one of the first things that on the prototype that you ride on the black bike, 
that we we built that bike up um, in terms of specification, the same as the Evo. Current one. Yeah, so Current the, the, the old one as it were now. Yeah. Um, so all that was different was the frame and the shock tune. Uh, all of the rest of the spec was the same, so we were keeping the variables down. Yeah. And uh, Brown and I went out on the bikes and we did uh, three runs back to back and then swapped and then kind of went through. And we didn't talk to each other about what we were doing until the end. Mm. And um, one of the, the biggest things that we f that was just the ability to winch your way up was much easier. You were much more further forward. Your weight was over the BB. Yeah. And, it, and then that increased reach then. You weren't feeling like you were hitting your knees on the saddle, mm. uh, on the handlebars. Um, so that was one of the biggest things that we really took from that bike. Um, and I said the head angle on that black bike wasn't we felt wasn't slack enough no so then it went out a, d a further degree that's right yeah so um it's yeah. crazy how much you notice that degree yeah it's nuts it's isn't crazy. it yeah i mean this has been a journey for me as well i've said that from the get-go with this whole series about learning more about bikes how they work not just the people behind them and it, it was interesting though to ride two almost back to back and go that degree has totally changed how this bike rides like, yeah it just brings that confidence stable, yeah for sure um so yeah, so that was you know one of the things we learned was that, that, that you know when we were riding we were just gonna it just needs a bit more it, mm. it just because you felt like you could push it and then you were starting to get yourself into a little bit yeah. of trouble yeah yeah and we were like well we know that with the the, the work we do with the century like how much that head angle really inspires that confidence mm. um, so we were like well let's just drop it out a little bit um, further um, and then in terms of the spec uh, we went the the SX Eagle is kind of one of the standout features. Yeah. Um, I tried to get 12 speed uh, on the Evolu the Evo version, um, but it was just that it was too expensive um, for the, the time. Uh, but the SX Eagle, um, which is an OE uh, so, um, original equipment, you, so you can't buy aftermarket, no. but um, it just means that you've got it there. And you know, if a customer snaps a rear mech, you could buy an NX rear derailleur. Okay which are pretty cheap yeah, uh, and it yeah. will fit and it will work. Um, so it's that upgradability, but ultimately straight out of the box, you got a 50 tooth, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. Uh, Mate, again, like, you know, especially living where we live in the peaks, 90% of riding's uphill and it, no issues at all, you know, with climbing, yeah, just, gearing, it's, it's set up, like yeah, set out of the box, go for a ride, no issues, you don't yeah. have to change anything. And like, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, the, the 50 tooth, like, um, we, there's a couple of fit lads that w that work in with us that kind of go, oh, get off that drug and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. I just wouldn't survive with that. No, I need it, man. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like caffeine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just knowing it's there, it's like a comfort blanket. You know? um, it's stinking cold at the moment as well, so it's it's definitely being used at the moment. Um, yeah. So then we changed the because of the, the 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 changes in the bike and the way it was being ridden. We worked with Rockshock um, and uh, uh, a wonderful man called Torben, based okay. in Schweinfurt, uh, uh, who I've worked with with the Century Project. So he's amazing. Like his name will come up, and like there would be so many other people. Like oh, no, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a he's a very clever man. Uh, so uh, I was able to send him our kinematic data. He came back with a, a, a shock tune. Uh, we rode it, we were like, yeah, happy days, that works really well. Yeah. Um, so we were happy with that. And then the fork uh, is the Recon RL, which is the same fork as last year, but it's the updated version. Um, so it's got the fast black stanchions, um, which not only look cool, but they- Totally transforms how the bike look. Yeah, it just opinion. makes just it look so much more high end, uh, but also uh, does make the, the fork perform better, okay. less stiction. Okay. Um, also, I think the lowers, no, this is where I'll get into trouble with SRAM. I think they're the old Reba okay. lowers, so they're a lot lighter. Um, right. uh, because I think it's not so much the lowers are uh, lighter, but they're able to use uh, uh, shorter uh, uppers. So obviously there's mm -hmm. less material, so that's overall lighter. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's really good. Um, and then we've got the level T brakes, um, which are really lightweight. It's their cross country. They're good. But, yeah. but they're super, they're super yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, like I said, one of the standard when we did we did a shoot with Ali uh, in Morzine, and one of the first things he sent back, which was a bit annoying to be fair, was how good the brakes were. He didn't tell me how great the bike was or anything. He was just, oh, the brakes were brilliant. Like, all right, everything else. <laughs> they are. Right? They yeah. are great. They're a good brake. Yeah, for yeah. like you know, they're, 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 they're a lot of power in a, in a small package. Yeah. Um, and then like nice little things like uh, so I've I've worked with WTB for a long time. 
we used to distribute them at rally. So okay. uh, I got to know the the WTB family, and they are really like a family. Actually, um, they're really like they're a really cool company. Right. Um, you should definitely try and get hold of yeah, any sure. of those guys. I'll do it. Um, yeah. So the, those guys, um, you know, we've worked really closely with their European office as well as their the US uh, guys. And um, so yeah, the, the we've had the WTB tires on the bike from the get go, and the tire is the same but we managed to get these uh their their, their soft sort of uh compound uh so they call it the high grip okay. uh compound on this comp level tire right. so normally it was kind of much higher uh, harder does that only come on this bike no there's a few others they've opened it out there's okay. um so there's a few other brands using it um but it's uh it's you know so it's not something that's only on ours mm. but uh for certain it's it was really cool to work with those guys and and, and able to get that on this uh on this bike and just it's small things like that, I think, that offer the rider just like more confidence mm. um, until they wear this out and uh, and want to put on uh, like a, a you know tubeless ready tire, yeah. um, which is again down to spec. You know, a few things that we always see on the the comment sections oh, yeah. is why is it not got a dropper and why is it not got tubeless ready tires? Because the wheels are tubeless ready. But you could um, do that for two hundred pounds, two hundred quid, yeah, and, and you. Done. Yeah. Um, the dropper thing, you know, it is what it is. It, it's first world problems, isn't it? Yeah. It's like... It's got a quick release. It's got a quick release. And, mate, again, it's not that hard. You get to the bottom of the trail, you're knackered anyway. You get off, put your saddle seat up, crack on. Yeah, it gives you an ability to 30 seconds extra yeah, rest. Yeah, it does, yeah. He's like, sorry, lads, I'm just uh, sorting this out. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's first world problems. It'd yeah, be lovely to have one, but if totally. You, like, so you know, you know I'll, I'll be open and honest. You know, that 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 seat post costs about three and a half dollars. Mm. Where a seat, a dropper seat post that I'd be happy to put on a bike and know that that you know that we use is about forty five dollars. Yeah, Big difference. give or take. So Big you know, in, in terms of then like people go oh, forty dollars, I'd, I'd pay that and go well, no, because I need to make money on it as yeah. well. Yeah. Um. So it ends up probably being we'd have to probably put a hundred pounds give or take, maybe mm. £80 pounds up on that, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got, let's say, the Triple B, which is the next model above, which has all of those things on, right. you know, which was the, the, kind of looking back again like, at seeing what everyone was doing to their boss nuts. That's where the Triple B kind of came from, was like, going, well, you know, we saw people are putting uh, better suspension forks, uh, tubeless ready tyres, dropper post, um, and, uh, you know, a few other bits and pieces. We were like, well, should we just do that as a package? You know, say if, if someone has that money, yeah. instead of having to go and buy all the individual components, which I appreciate some people really like doing and personalising, yeah, yeah. which is fine. Uh, but, you know, we, then they, they've still got the option. Um, but, yeah, the triple B was let's just do all of that yeah. in a yeah. bike out of the box. So, yeah. Okay, excellent. I mean... My feedback's obviously extremely positive. I've loved riding the things. You know, there's little things like yeah, it could do a dropper, obviously, but I think like man-made trail centre stuff, there's probably not many better bikes. It's so good at stuff like that. Like Lady Canning's, yeah, insane. You know, it's it, fast down places like that. Yeah, and poppy and fun. Poppy, fun, 100%, I think. I rode Warncliffe in the wet. That was, that was tough, but that's hard on any bike. Yeah. You know, anyone who goes to Warncliffe and rides that place fast is a bloody good rider anyway. Yeah. So, you know, that was a little harder. Again, tyres getting full of mud. Little things like that. Yeah. But again, know. it's not what it's really made for. It's no, an and, bike uh, to get people into the sport. Yeah, totally. And, and like I say, we've seen people backflipping them. And yeah. then, you know, uh, lad sent us a video of Avan uh, on the jumps and stuff like hitting, uh, hitting some pretty big... Uh, jumps on them and stuff and, it's, and uh, you know it definitely will take a, a, a fair it, amount of sure. it yeah, but yeah, yeah in terms of like when it you know starts to get down onto the more enduro or whatever you're in the more techies then that's where the, the century really came about was yeah. well we've, we we want to give people that option uh, yeah. before and i've said it in the, in other interviews and stuff uh, when we only had when this was our range topping bike and i still am totally happy if you got this bike and it gets you into mountain biking so I've got my left hand side of my face twitches and I go and see a neurosurgeon uh, and uh, he's uh, got a boss now. Right. And uh, he's, uh, cause he lives down in, in South Wales. And I want to see him, uh, so I see him every three months to get Botox in my face to mm. try and stop it from twitching as much. And, uh, and um, 
I saw him the last time I saw him was about six weeks ago. He's like, oh, I'm really sorry, but uh, I've bought a new bike. And I was like, what have you bought? And he's like, oh, I've bought a Santa Cruz Hightower. I was like, great. And he's like, you're not annoyed. I was like, not at all. <laughs> I was like, because you've just dropped like five grand. You're now a mountain biker. Yeah. Whether you want to be on it, you are not going to go back. That's true. And then like, you know, and you might be sat in the cafeteria or whatever with your colleagues going, oh, you're a mountain biker. What should I get? And you're going to be possibly, or well, hopefully, yeah. really, really positive about, well, if you're going to get into it, you should get a get car a bus for a year or so. See what yeah, you think. and see what you 100%. think. And, then, and, and, and so I was like, yeah. like that's, that's totally what, fine. What, um, so my, my mum's husband used to ride mountain bikes. He's got an old Zaska Ellie. Nice. It's sick. It's so, oh, I used to have one of them. pimp, right? But obviously he's not ridden it for <coughs> probably 10 years, something like that. Uh, and I dropped this off. Uh, well, it's the black one, actually. I dropped off with him. I was like, I'll go for a ride on that. You know, anyway, straight down to go outdoors, bought himself a pair of new 510s and whatever. So he's all geared up and uh, went out in the evening and yeah, rang me straight up. He's like, 100%, I'll buy one of those. How much are they? I was like, they're a thousand quid. Oh, wow. Yeah, perfect bike for me. Like it is. It's the perfect bike for someone like that. Maybe not been in the sport for a while, wants to get back into it or you get into the sport from nothing. Yeah. So, he's the, you know, it's perfect customer, isn't it, for you guys? It's like that older gentleman, a little bit of disposable income as well. Thousand quids, yeah. It's a lot of money, but it's not in the grand scheme of things as opposed to, you know, opening up a magazine and going the cheapest bike in here is three and a half grand. Yeah, um, like how how do I justify that to see if I like it? Yeah, we did the the video for for the launch of this, and it was a real we the were cult. Yeah, we were, <laughs> super, we were we were super nervous. Like, so we were like, what do we do? You know, we were sat there. So it was Johnny G and Sam and I. We were sort of like going like, you know, how do we launch this? We need to sort of basically come across that it's completely new, mm. but at the same time not. You know, it's still the same uh, ethos, the same idea behind yeah. it. We don't want to alienate anyone that's bought the old one um, because they're still great bikes. They wouldn't have won all those awards, yeah. but we still need to say, look, we have moved on because you can't sit still. Mm. Um, and then I came up with this idea about, like, say, the, the Boston Owners Group, and there's 1,500 members. And it's our Facebook group, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nothing to do with us. <laughs> like, I have, I'm not even on it anymore. Um, it was just becoming too difficult. And I, I don't mean this in a nasty way, because I do so much on social media in terms of answering questions anyway. Yeah, yeah. I was answering a lot of questions on their group as well that ultimately I didn't need to answer Got because you. there's a lot of, there's a wealth of knowledge on that group mm. so people were going to be able to answer it for them anyway yeah. um, and it didn't need to come from the horse's mouth as such mm. um, and if they needed that they could go to Calibre Facebook and then it would I would answer it if you yeah. see me um, so uh, and it was a request from my missus to spend less time on my phone which I'm oh, trying 100%. so hard to do yeah. with two young boys it's uh, I don't want to be that one of those parents that are constantly on no, the phone no so yes, yeah, so we got in contact with the guys and um, I and just said, look, we're going to go to Leeds and Bike Park, uh, and you know, do you want to come? We kind of left it really kind of vague about what we were what we were doing, um, and uh, there was about fifty uh, of guys and girls turned up, and it was guys and girls. It was brilliant. Sick. Um, but then, like, say the 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 breadth. We had a young lad who was eleven. Uh, that weirdly, him and his dad came to, I want to say, the NEC bike show. And I spent a good 40 minutes chatting them through their bikes. Um, they had, weirdly had a tractor to sell. Um, first, they had a tractor to sell, which was going to give them the money to buy them both a new bike. Wow, okay. So I quite like tractors. Being a, a, Did you a, buy a tractor? A, a West Country boy. <laughs> I wish I had a garden big enough for a tractor. Um, yeah, so, um, so, they, so, the, so they were there. And mm. so uh, the little lad was on a, a, a Bosna Evo and his dad was on a Triple B obviously treating himself to the, mm-hmm. the higher end one. Um, and uh, that's it, he showed that. Then you had another gentleman there that was, uh, his son was quite a bit older, was on a nice Mondi, good rider, like yeah. hucking himself off of everything going. And uh, I was chatting to him and he was just saying like, you know, he had no aspirations to be as good as his son, but he just enjoyed going out with his son and yeah. it enabled yeah. him to do that. And then there was guys, you know, sort of, sort of elder teens, you know, okay. sort, of, sort of 18, 19. Again, when it's hard to get. Yeah, and they were having fun on their bike and, they were, and there was a, a, another kind of lad there who was just sending everything. He was just following Ali. You could see him just kind of going, 
like f just I'm going to fall alley speed and that will definitely give me the 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 speed to the you know which d might have put in because Ali's got some serious pop right. so he can come into stuff a lot slower than most people um but yeah and then you had like you know older guys there that were like I don't know I don't want to kind of cap but they were probably late 50s mm. um uh, early 60s and they were still riding a bike and having Huge fun. Demographic yeah, so like, and it was a really humbling experience. You know, I'll be, you know, I am. It was a real kind of, uh, yeah, real weird one for me because right. um, it was like herding cats at the same time, <laughs> trying to get this whole video done. Um, but at the same time, I just kept on kind of taking a step back and just seeing the smiles. And, and, and then we did like a bit of a talking. Or G did a talking head thing, and I wasn't around when he when he did that. And then we watched some of the raw footage back. And there was like, yeah, genuine good stories about how like people had got back into riding after a huge amount of time off and they were enabling them to get over illness or there was one guy that was really brave to speak about his mental health and how uh, just getting out on his bike just enables him to kind of reset almost and then wow. come back in and, and be happy. And I don't know yeah. he would do that on any bike, but it was great that he chose one of, one yeah. of ours. Yeah. Then there was uh, one lad that was going to, he's one of the main guys of the, was going to race Hard Rock. Unfortunately, obviously that got mm. cancelled and uh, um, for all due course. <laughs> and I was gutted for that, but I broke my ribs two weeks before it. Yeah. So I was gutted, but also quite relieved because I was going to have a go and just roofing myself up to the eyeballs <laughs> and just deal with, deal with it as it came Proof around. Roof that up, I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vitamin I, as it's commonly known in our <laughs> circle of friends. Um yeah, so it was a really, yeah, it was a, a bit of a nervous time for us because we didn't know, normally, you, you, you know, you, product launch videos are get a rider that's pretty handy yeah. and just tread it, you yeah. know, kind of thing. But we really wanted to kind of just showcase that uh, that it was a boss nut, even though it was a new one, but it still had that, that same mm. idea behind it. Yeah, mm. so. Also, it came across really well with people listening. I'll put a link in the show description to watch that video because it's good. It's yeah, really, it's, really good. it's different. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is yeah. a perfect launch video, I think. Um, is there anything else really like that, that we need to know about this bike other than, I mean, like, where can people buy one? And um, So the moment, uh, yeah, like, you know, obviously go outdoors. Um, their website is, uh, you know, up and running at the moment, but in terms of international guys, you gotta bear with us. They've had okay. some teething problems with their brand new website. Okay. Um, so they've said it will be up and running in about three weeks. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening and uh, you wanted to get one from, a lot of people from uh, the Scandinavian country, I think oh. the, I think it must just be the currency. Is, Dude, everything's expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, our, and our currency currently is taking a nosedive. Yeah. So fair play to you guys and the same with the US guys as well. So bear with us, that should be up and running uh, soon. Uh, but if you're in the UK mainland, then obviously there's uh, around uh, nearly 70 stores nationwide. Uh, and then there's the website as well, so you can get it delivered into store. Um, but no, I think ultimately really about all of the bikes, um, it's, yeah, they're just there to have fun and, and, and go and get into biking. And like I said before, if you if you get one of these and like uh, Dr. Evans decide to go and drop five grand on someone else's <laughs> bike, then you're hooked, then you're into the sport and uh, I'm all good with that, you know, nice that's job, totally yeah. fine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Cool, all right, and then anything happening in the future which you, you know you want to shout about? Like, Yes, we've got NEC show is in two weeks time, which is kind of scary. Oh, is it? So yeah. right after Eurobike? Yeah, like literally oh. right. Yeah, Eurobike? Uh, yeah, so Eurobike, so I'm, I'm only there for a day, okay. which is... Perfect though. <laughs> it's good, but it's like manic because I've got so much to do in a day, so okay. I'm gonna have to be really, really on it. Um, and then, yeah, we're back and then all hands to the pump to get everything ready. We've got quite a lot of new stuff to show uh, that is next year's model. So mm -hmm. we've got two new hardtails, uh, two new gravel bikes. Um, and and uh, yeah, so like, so there's some new stuff coming from us, um, you know, and uh, yeah, we're working on some other things in the in the future as well. That'll be 2021, which okay. is scary to think about it. Sure. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're, you know, we're not sitting still and uh, we'll definitely be evaluating this bike, you know, give it a couple more months and, and we'll see what people are doing and, and see if there's anything else that we can do to improve. But yeah, we definitely won't sit still. Well, no, it doesn't sound like it. Um, and as far as following you guys, Instagram, at Ride Calibre. Yeah, at Ride Calibre, Ride Calibre. And then Facebook, yeah, just uh, search us out. And then we've got, obviously, the Go Outdoors website, but there's also uh, CaliberBicycles.com, yeah. um, where there's, a, you know, a bit more tech and a bit more information on there. 
Um, and then, yeah, just uh, yeah, if you ask a question on Facebook, it will be me. <laughs> if it's a sudden influx of questions, you might have to bear with me. Um, but yeah, so uh, especially if I'm at Eurobike and the NEC show. Yeah. But like I say, NEC show, if you want to come down and, and see us, uh, we will be giving away loads of freebies. So we've got awesome. hats and stickers and sweets and yeah, all right. sorts of stuff. So. Yeah, hopefully, you know, there's a fair amount of people listen to this. So if you do, if you do head to the NEC and you've listened to this, Go say hello to Mike. Yeah. There might be a queue for him. <laughs> Get in the yeah. queue. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, dude. Again, thank you for the opportunity to to do this for you. No uh, worries, thank to ride you. the bike. Um, it's always good to ride bikes, no matter what names on it. Yeah. You know, I'm just loving riding bikes at the moment. We've had a beautiful summer. It's almost barely rained since I've had this as well, which has been amazing. Yeah, you've been really lucky. Yeah, I've been super lucky. <laughs> but I've thoroughly enjoyed the whole experience, man, of, of learning more about it and. And getting to know you a bit better as well because we yeah, didn't really know each other that well. No, not at all. No, no, it's, it's, it's quick cool. email, weren't it? Like, yeah. you want to do this? Like, yeah, go on then, do it. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for the opportunity no and, worries, and cheers, thank buddy. you to everybody who's listening for listening to the podcast. Yeah, and uh, let us know what you think. Reach out. Let Caliber know if you've listened. Let me know if you've listened. If you have enjoyed the episode, share it with your friends as well. Yeah, that'd be cool. Rad. Cheers, Rad. guys. <laughs> go. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for lending me your ears and for checking out another episode of the Hook It podcast. Don't forget, there's plenty more in the back catalogue for you to check out. If you're a mountain bike fan, action sports fan, there is a hundred other episodes of the world's best athletes, brand owners and personalities. Uh, If you have enjoyed this episode, please reach out. Let us know what you think. If you can share the episode with your friends on social media, it's a huge help. You can follow us at the Hook It Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and it's www.hookitproducts.co.uk where you will find the entire back catalogue and a host of other bike products too. All right, enjoy the rest of your week, people. Thanks for listening once again. Go ride your bike. Peace out.